Welcome back, everybody. My name is Dr. Pauly, and here in MGT4520, today, today, we are going to talk about how to select international business opportunities. So let's go. The objectives we're going to try and reach today include understanding how to select the most appropriate foreign market, determining the best indicators for entry into a foreign market, how to identify primary and secondary sources of information on foreign market industries or consumers, as well as how to collect country market data and how to assess competitive strengths and weaknesses in foreign markets and determine a strategy to establish a competitive market position. So let's take a look at the foreign market selection model. Within this model, we have five components and the first being developing appropriate indicators. And what this really means is, is what are we going to look at that's going to tell us what information can we gather that's really going to tell us whether or not this is a good opportunity or it's a bad opportunity, or is it gonna be a fruitful opportunity, or might this cost us a lot of money? The second component is collecting data and converting it into comparable indicators. And again, we will go through this much more in depth in the next couple of slides. The third indicator, or sorry, the third component being establishing an appropriate weight for each indicator, followed by analyzing the data that we've collected. And then number five, select the appropriate market from the rankings that we have determined. This brings us to step one, developing appropriate indicators. As I said before, these are different aspects of business, different aspects of the market that we can really look at and judge whether or not it is a market that we want to enter. And, and part of these indicators might include past sales, competitive research, experience, discussion with other global entrepreneurs. I cannot stress enough the importance of networking, not only in this field, but in all fields. Networking is incredibly important and we can gather great intelligence, great information just by talking to people, whether it be over a Zoom meeting, whether it be a phone call, gathering information from other individuals who have already lived it is incredibly important. And what are we doing with these key indicators then? We're looking at the overall market. Is the market growing? Is it contracting? If it's growing, how quickly? If it's contracting, how quickly? We can look at products and services in the business to business market. Or alternatively, we can look at the business to consumer market, which the indicators you might want to focus on might include the population, the per capita income, market for a specific product or service, or even profits within that industry. This leads us to the second step of the five step process. And the second step involves collecting data and converting that data into comparable indicators. Now, when we have data, really it breaks down into two simple forms. We have primary data and we have secondary data. Now, primary data is we go out and physically collect the information. So this is information that's not been published, like interviews, might be telephone calls, might be surveys, right? This is primary data collection. Whereas secondary data, the information has already been collected, it's been analyzed, and it's been published. So this information is readily available. This is known as our journal articles, might be a news briefing, it might be other sorts of information that we can read and gather that are readily available to us. Now, as it pertains to this course, we are only going to focus on secondary data for multiple reasons, one being that primary data collection takes time, often it costs money and, and can cost quite a bit of money. So secondary data, this information is usually already readily available out there. And this is again, very important for this course when we're using information to help with the different challenges that we're completing, it's important to reference where you received all of your information. Where did you get this information? Because using references is incredibly important to help support and validate your ideas. Now, some of the issues with secondary data come down to its ability or, or the data's ability to be comparable. How readily available is it? How accurate is it? And again, another part of it too is the cost of the data. So if we need to go to Harvard Business Review, if we need to go to other journal sources, 
um, there might be an associative cost. Now, as it pertains to this course, we have the Entrepreneurship Library Guide on the Middlesex University Library website. Almost all of the information that you need for this course is on the Entrepreneurship Library Guide, right? So head on over to Middlesex University Library website, search for the Entrepreneurship Library Guide in the search function, and you will have all the information, well, most of the information that you need there. Now, when we're here in this database, whether we're looking at journal articles, we're looking online, we're looking for this information. What really what we're looking for is economic and demographic details. Now, this means the population, population size, population density. What are the genders of the population? What is the disposable income? What's and again, if we look at the economics of the market, what's the gross domestic product or otherwise known as GDP? per capita income, inflation rate, literacy rate, right? Are we dealing with a population that is highly educated or are we dealing with a population that is poorly educated? Does it matter, right? So these are all the things that we're going to collect, especially as it pertains to whether or not we're gonna go into a new foreign market that will help us determine whether or not it is a good idea to actually expand our business globally. So now that we've determined we're going to do secondary research, where do we get this information from? Where do we go? How do we find it? And the good news is there's loads of places that have information. Some of these places might be government agencies, websites. You can even go to the embassies of some of the countries that are operating within the country that you're looking to expand to. You have different country reports. You have food market reports. You have trade associations, industry data. Now, as it pertains to North America, we have the NAICS, which categorizes and classifies all the industries that exist in North America. This is helpful because if we're looking at, say, the transportation industry, well, that will be one classification. But if we're looking at busing within the transportation industry, that will be its own whole subsection. Right? That will have its own classification. So we can look at types of, of information like that. We can identify groups of information like that in order to really expand and understand whether or not that market is saturated. Is there opportunity in that market? Now, do keep in mind, not all countries have this level of sophistication when it comes to classification and order. There are a lot of countries out there where the, the information is scattered all around. So again, part of your task as a researcher, whether it's primary research, interviewing, surveying, telephone, or a secondary data collection avenue, where you're just seeking this information and where it's published, but this information is all around you. And that's, that's the great part of being a researcher is, is really getting to try and explore and, and find that that information. This leads us to step number three, which is establish an appropriate weight for each indicator. A big part of this is identifying what's relevant. What information is useful to us? What information can we just get rid of? What, what's wasting our time? Because again, in this process, we really want to maximize our efficiency and effectiveness when it comes to really identifying whether or not we want to expand into a market. And one of the examples I put here is, you know, manufacturing hospital beds. So if you're the manufacturer of a company that is creating hospital beds and distributing hospital beds, some of the questions that you might want to start asking different hospitals or different centers that deal with hospital beds is you know, how many and what types of hospital beds do you actually use? How old is your hospital? How old is your health center? And do you actually use beds? How old are the beds that are in your stock? Do you rotate your stock? How old is your stock, right? And another part could simply be, what's the government expenditure on healthcare for your facility? Does, your, does the local government help subsidize your facility? Does the federal government help subsidize your facility? You're really trying to uh, uncover what is important when it comes to this topic. Now, this procedure results in each indicator receiving a weight that reflects its relative importance. 
and there's many different ways you can do this. You could you, you could put all of your indicators on a sheet and rank them from one to 10, 10 being the most important, one being reject, or you can even put an R. I've seen some people put A for accept, R for reject. But you wanna categorize, you wanna go through all of the indicators that you've looked at, what's of value, what's important for you. Now, the assignment of points and weights, as well as the selection of indicators, varies greatly from one global entrepreneur to another, and indeed is somewhat arbitrary in some cases. And, and this is important to gauge not only in your research, but research in general. You will value some things more so than others. Just imagine you're going out with friends, right? You're going to a restaurant you collectively have to come up with a decision on which restaurant to go to. Each of you is going to have your own opinion. You know, some people might like meat, some people might like vegetables, some people might like certain ethnic cuisines, some people might just want to, you know, a double cheeseburger. But at the end of the day, each of you is going to have specific values and weights of importance on what you value. Okay, it's no different when it comes to research. So you as the principal investigator, you in this process, in this class, in this course, really need to determine what's important for you. Building off of that, you also will need to tell me why that is the case, right? So it's not just telling me what's important, but you're also going to back that up with why it's important. So if you're selecting certain indicators and things that you think are relevant to your challenge, to your business, to the expansion of the business, you really need to justify with why. And again, as we said a couple slides ago, this is really going to give you credibility, reliability, and validity when it comes to your decision making. And if you can support these ideas or these recommendations or these assertions with references, with other information that exists that show that, yeah, it might work, it's incredibly important to back that up. It's incredibly important to use your references. Now, regardless, this requires intensive thinking and internal discussion, which results in better market selection decisions. Now, this might be the most important part of the five-step process, and this comes down to analyzing the data. You're looking at the information that you've collected, and you really need to synthesize and understand what's important. What's a value? What are you finding? Are there themes here? Are there certain things that are sticking out to you? Are there certain things that you say, hey, hold on a second, this could be something, right? Analyzing the information is critically important to the whole process because you can do it right and you can do it wrong, right? And so either way, it's important that you, you be very careful and you comb through the information and look at it numerous times. It's not a one and done process. You really need to look at it, digest it, clearly synthesize the information and then actually maybe bounce the idea off or ideas off a few people just to say, hey, this is what I've come up with. Does this sound anything remotely good? Does this sound anything that could be accurate? And again, this is a process where you might want to go back to those entrepreneurs or those other people that you've chatted to before in your preliminary discussions and say, hey, this is actually what I kind of found. What do you think? Right? It's that interaction. It's that engagement because the more information that you can collect and that you can get in feedback, it's going to make your research that much stronger. And at the end of the day, when we're looking at either starting a business or expanding our business globally, the more information we have, the more likely we will be successful, the more likely we will be able to survive, the more likely our business will not fail if our information is good, if our analysis is good. And again, nothing is perfect. But again, we're trying to make the best decisions that we can given the information that we've collected, given the information that we've analyzed. At the end of the day, you really, you want to conduct a what if analysis. If this happens, what do I do? 
if this happens, how does this impact this, right? You have all the capability to take some of these different things that you've found. And again, if we're putting weighting on different things, like what's more important? Well, currency might be very important. The, the local indigenous culture might be extremely important. And again, you wanna put different weights on these aspects of the global expansion into or, or, or more or less under a microscope and you can change the weighting of these important values to see, well, if this happens, then what? It's all about planning. It's all about contingency planning. It's all about foresight. It's all about anticipating what might or might not happen. So we're in a good place now. We've collected our data. We've analyzed the data. And now it's it's go time. What do we do? What do we do? Where do we go? And this is step five. Select the appropriate market from the rankings. So again, we're not just applying this to one area. We might be applying this to multiple areas. And from the information, from our contingency planning, from our stress test. And again, if you want to get really technologically advanced with it, you could do some sort of, you know, AI, or you could do some sort of machine learning, and you could do some sort of, of testing or simulation of what may or may not happen. Again, that's quite sophisticated, and I don't anticipate that happening at a micro and small business level. But it goes to show you that if we play these games, it's cheaper to do it behind a desk than it is after we've invested our money. When we put our money on the table, it's go time, right? We have to make things happen. And if they're not happening, we have to adapt. We have to cope. We've got to move forward, right? Kind of like a shark, always swimming forward. So once you've selected the appropriate market from these rankings, you need to also establish short and long-term goals. What do I want to accomplish in the short term? What do I want to accomplish in the long term? And, and a big part of that, as we see here on this slide, is developing an entry and exit strategy. Okay, so this is how we're going to get into the market. If things go well, this is how long we plan on staying for. Again, long-term strategy. But if things don't go well, what are we going to do? How do we minimize our losses? right? Or if things go extremely well, is there the opportunity then to sell the business possibly, right? So we're trying to develop entry and exit strategies when we're trying to globalize the company. Now, many of you are probably sitting there listening to this, possibly watching it, thinking, what's this guy talking about? Like, I understand some of it, but What's all this indicator stuff? What's all these other things that I got to look up? Well, if you're struggling with that, so not only do we have the market indicators, so the big ones, so we, we can look at this from macro and micro level, right? So macro level, in business school, you're going to learn different types of analyses tools, such as a PESTL, right? Political, environmental, social, technological, legal, economic, Right, so that's macro level of analysis. So those indicators, they would give us the, the greater picture, right? They would help us form the map. Now, when we have that map, where do we go, right? So a map isn't just made of borders. There's other things that we need in order to really understand the map, such as cities, such as rivers, such as trees, such as hills, right? And those finite details are the micro levels of analysis that we're looking for. Now, different analyses tools, such as SWOT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, will give a micro level of analysis for your business. You can also do it against competitors. But some of the other, you know, internal company information. So on a micro level, level some of the internal information that you can use is you know, cash flow is your financial statements is, you know, again, when you've been networking with these other global entrepreneurs, so firsthand experience, right? You can also purchase competitive information online through reports and whatnot. 
if you've been at any trade shows. So remember, a lot of this is, is a combination of primary and secondary data, but it's all coming from the individual and it's giving you that individual perspective. Now, at the end of the day, what you really need to understand is, now this is not a golden rule, and this is not the rule, but a general rule is in foreign markets with good potential, they are the ones that a company's competitors are trying to enter as well, right? So if you have a lot of competition trying to enter that country, it's a pretty good indication that there is something there worth exploring, right? And again, this is no different than regular business startups. This is no, reg uh, this is no different than operating a business at home. What is the competitive landscape? Do you have a competitive advantage? What is your competitive advantage? Where do you fit in the grand scheme of this game? Taking this from your textbook, Table 5.1, this is just an illustration of the rankings of countries on various business criteria. And there's a great repository slash database called the World Bank. And the World Bank ranks each country and the ease of doing business there. So in this table, we can see on the left-hand side, you have the different countries, you have the different economies. And then along the top of this scale, we have different topics such as ease of doing business rank. That's kind of the easy, that's kind of simple one on the far left. But if we get into the middle of the table, we see getting electricity, getting credit, money. How can you finance this, right? Paying taxes enforcing contracts so all of these have an important bearing on whether or not you want to enter specific global markets so if we look at norway for example which is number nine on this list it is the ninth easiest country in the world to do business okay but it's also 53rd for starting a business so it has significant startup issues Right, and why is that the case? Well, maybe not significant, but it's in the middle of the pack. We can see that you know dealing with construction permits, they're 28th. That's not bad. That's getting better. So what what are they good at? Okay, so enforcing contracts, number four, they must have a very good legal system, which then trickles down to the next column on your right, which is resolving insolvency, which is bankruptcy, and they are number two. So again. From this, just looking at it at, at a macro level, I'm, I'm not overly familiar with Norway, but looking at it from a macro level, just from this table, we can see that it probably has a pretty strong legal structure. Now, starting a business is a bit difficult being at 53. So is that finance issues? Is you know market saturation? Why is that the case? So again, this gives us a broad understanding of what could be useful to us in terms of information and whether or not, you know, we need to or want to explore different opportunities. And remember, just because the country is easy to do business in doesn't mean you have to, doesn't mean you should. Likewise, if the country is very difficult to do business in and you actually accomplish doing business in that country, it could be very fruitful. Right, so different ways of looking at this opportunity. Remember, problems are just opportunities to solve. Now, this is where it starts to get interesting, okay? We're no longer just worried about our company. We're not just worried about where we're going. Now we gotta worry about the competition, right? And so the table right there, this helps you understand just where you fit into the whole scheme of things. Where are you on the game? Where are you on the map? Where are your competitors, right? And we can look at things such as product or service strategies, pricing strategies, distribution strategies. Another simple way of doing this, I'm not saying it is the best way, but it is a way, is the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. The SWOT analysis, okay? As I said, I'm not saying it is the be all end all for analysis tools, but it'll certainly give us a decent idea of what's going on out there, 
right? Again, here in table 5.2 from your textbook, it is going to give you a little bit of a guidance here, especially when it comes to different strategies that not only are you prospectively going to use, but more importantly, what are your competitors using, okay? Knowing the competition is just as important as knowing you, knowing your business, knowing your brand, knowing your identity. Where do you fit in the game? Where do you fit in the marketplace? What are they good at? What are you good at? And again, if we look at just this table 5.2 and how simple it is, we're just looking at different things like pricing. Where's their product, product placement? Are they online? Do they have a storefront? What promotions do they run? You are basically creating or identifying, but you're creating a profile of what that business is about. And it's not just the superficial things like, well, they do advertisements on Instagram, but what advertisements? Are they doing video? Are they doing music? Are they doing sound? If you want to dive right into it, what are they doing in terms of their colors, their color schemes? Are they doing natural tones? Are they doing vibrant tones? Are they talking about different environmental initiatives that they're doing? All of this information is critically important to know and understand because you need to know what are they good at? What are you good at? What are you not good at? What are they not good at? Because again, if they're not good at certain things, if there are certain opportunities that you can capitalize, again, that is how you can get into the marketplace. And that's how you can start creating barriers to prevent your competition from taking you over. What we see on the slide here is another two tables, again, taken from your textbook, table 5.3, determining the company's competitive position. But what this is, is it gives you a little bit of insight. It gives you a visual representation of how you can outline what your company is doing, what your competitors are doing, right? What is the difference? What can you capitalize on? What do you need to be weary of? What are they good at, right? It's all about collecting the information, but just as important as collecting the information, you really need to understand where you fit, where your company fits in the grand scheme of the marketplace. Hi there. I know I'm a little bit closer this time, but that's because I got to tell you something. This right here, it's an important slide because this slide here, what we're trying to do is determine the value of the product or service in the international market. And all of this comes from financial projections. We can base a lot of our sales from what we do domestically. But when we're looking at things internationally, again, a lot of different things play into our valuations, our, our strategy development but we need to put together some sort of financial strategy that involves what's our cash outflow? What's our cash inflow? What's our net cash flow, right? Are we making a profit? Is there a return? What do we have to compare this with, right? At the very least, we need to see that it's at least financially feasible to enter this global market, this new market that we want to enter. Because if it's not, we really need to evaluate whether or not we want to take that financial risk. And again, this will play into our short and long-term goals. But if there is very little to no possibility of making profits by entering this market, unless we're on some sort of other social cause or some sort of, you know, uh, act to support local economies, et cetera, and, and we're just trying to break even, which is totally fine. But we want to make sure that we have a great understanding of what the value is for the product or service in the international market. What's it worth? Because some people in North America might pay substantially more than people in East Asia or vice versa, or what market are we entering in? Is it an emerging market? 
Is it, you know, a market that has significant environmental devastation? So a lot of factors play into, you know, whether or not we should expand into these markets. But one of the key things that we need to do, it's all about the money. So here we are, slide 15 of 17, almost done this session. And you might still be asking yourself, well, where am I going to get all this information from? I know all of my domestic information. I know how to find that. Yeah, that's no, that's, that's no problem. But where am I going to find information on Canada? Well, I have news for you, my friends. Here is a collection, again, taken from your textbook, Table 5.5, on different international databases of information. And these databases are also included in your Entrepreneurship Library Guide at Middlesex University. Some of them in include IBIS World. Some of them include Business Source Complete. So here we have a list of information that you can use to help support your international research, to help support your first and second challenge in this course. I cannot stress enough, this Entrepreneurship Library Guide here at Middlesex University is the place to go for information. It's not the only place, but it's a pretty good place. And I can be honest with you, the people at the library have done an exceptional job putting this information together for you. So please click on this link, go to the Entrepreneurship Library Guide at Middlesex University and find yourself some in information. That's it. You made it. You found the last slide. Good for you. Excellent job. That was how to select business opportunities in a global marketplace. Thanks for tuning in. I really enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed it and have a great week.